will you, will you pray with me? Allow these words to, to be the prayer of, of your heart. You asked for my hands, that you might use them for your purpose. I gave them for a moment, then withdrew them, for the work was hard. You asked for my mouth, to speak, speak out against injustice. I gave you a whisper, that I might not be accused. You asked for my eyes, to see the pain of poverty. I closed them, for I did not want to see. You asked for my life, that you might work through me. I gave a small part, that I might not get too involved. Lord, forgive my calculated efforts to serve you. Only when it is convenient for me to do so. Only in those places where it is safe to do so. Father, forgive us. Renew us. Send us as usable instruments that we might take seriously the meaning of your cross. And let's hear these words from the psalmist from Psalm 103. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. So, Many of you know what this morning is for us. We've been talking about it for several weeks, uh, and there are a couple reasons this is a, a great Sunday for us. Uh, one of those being uh, Faith Promise is just an important part of the rhythm of our church's life every year. Uh, as much as uh, we want to be about God's work in our neighborhoods, in our lives, uh, in our workplaces and schools, we are a part of a church that spans the globe. And we have amazing opportunities to be invested in the work on other, in other places all over the world. And, and so it, it's good for us uh, to, to take Sundays like this to remember that we're part of something bigger than our, than our own lives. The other reason this is a good Sunday for us is that since the last weekend in, or the first weekend in June of 2012, this is like the second time you don't have to listen to me preach. So... Uh, this, you may find that to be, you know, a, a nice reprieve. Um, don't worry, I'm back at it next week. Um, but we have a friend uh, as our special guest this morning. Uh, Shauna and I uh, went to school together in, in Kansas City, and her husband and I have been connected through various ministries through the years. Uh, and one of the things that has been so fun is uh, to, to know them and to hear their hearts, to see the ministry that they're involved, involved in. Uh, they co-pastor together in Bakersfield. Uh, so they are both California natives and uh, did their time in the Midwest and have returned to the promised land. Uh, <laughs> so we, sh we share, share that in, in, <laughs> in common. Um, Shauna has worked for Nazarene Missions International, and she has written uh, and continues to write for them uh, their curriculum, curricula, Cur <laughs> whatever the plural is for cur curriculum, and, and just continues to be invested in the work that's going on around the world. And so um, would you uh, welcome Shauna? And I, and as she comes up, I, I just want to, to pray for her, uh, for the Spirit to anoint her in this time. Father, we, we thank you for Shauna. We thank you for her ministry among us. And we ask, Lord, that as, as she reads your word, we would have ears to hear uh, what your Spirit is saying to the churches. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thanks, Curtis. Um, so awesome to be with you guys this morning. Thanks for having me. Thanks for letting me come and be a part of your Faith Promise weekend. Faith Promise is an exciting weekend, but I'm kind of curious. How many of you have ever, in your recollection, been a part of a Faith Promise, and you know what that is? 
Okay, some, yeah, absolutely. How many of you are like, Faith, what? What is this? What are we talking about? A few of you, this is your first time? Yeah, like what exactly is happening here? And how many of you, maybe even if you've grown up in the church and you've heard of the expression before, but you still are not really sure what the faith promise thing is, if you're really honestly, truly being, being honest. Anybody grew up in the church and you're still, yeah, Jane's willing to be honest. Pastor's wife can't be caught in a lie. Absolutely. Um, Well, Faith promises the day that we get to come together and we get to talk and discuss and dream about the mission of God for the global church. The mission of God for the global church that's so much bigger than any one place or person, but that spans the entire world. And did you know that Jesus himself had a mission statement? Do you you know that? Jesus himself had a mission statement. I know we, we hear about mission statements a lot. Jesus' mission statement was a little bit different than Google's or McDonald's. Um, a little bit different, but Jesus really did. You see, in Luke's gospel, which I hear from Curtis that you guys are gearing up to spend quite a bit of time in Luke's gospel. Awesome. Uh, In Luke's gospel, right after Jesus has just been baptized and then tempted by the devil, he is immediately sent into his new ministry. Well, we're going to get to read together the first thing that Jesus does and says in the scripture that he reads from as he first begins his new ministry. And so basically this, at the very starting point of Jesus' ministry, this is Jesus' mission statement. And if we are followers of Jesus, don't you think we ought to be fairly familiar with this statement? What do you think? A few heads are nodding. All right, you'll get used to me. That's fine. We'll have a good time this morning. Now, I, I have something I like to do whenever we read from the gospel. Because the gospels, these four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these gospels, Um, these are the stories of our Savior. This is the story of our Savior. And so I know for our congregation, whenever we read from the Gospels, we ask them to stand in respect of reading from the Gospels. So this morning, do you mind if I impose on you and ask you to stand to hear the reading of the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? It's Luke chapter 4, if you've got your Bibles, and I'm reading from the TNIV. Um, So this morning, if you want to follow along with me, in Luke chapter 4, and we're going to be beginning... Up at, verse thir- uh, up at verse 14. Hear the word of the Lord. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, do here in your hometown what we have heard you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, prophets are not accepted in their their hometowns. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, and yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. You may be seated. The mission statement of Jesus. We all like to get free stuff, right? Does anybody here tend to turn away free stuff? No, you do not. 
We like to get free stuff. In fact, just yesterday, um, just yesterday, our church, we had a big fundraiser for our Upwards basketball program. Big fundraiser, we'd been selling raffle tickets for a really long time, and there's all kinds of stuff that we were giving away. Um, don't tell any of the district superintendents that the Nazarene Church was having a raffle, but that's exactly what we did. Uh, we were having this big raffle, all kinds of stuff we were giving away, but the very last thing that was being raffled off was something called a $10,000 shot. Has anybody been a part of something like this? Basically, what we did, we, we got in involved with this insurance company that will insure you for a $10,000 shot. You sell raffle tickets, you draw somebody's name, and that person has a chance, one shot, standing at half court to try to, to make a shot standing from half court. I mean, how many people can do that? But if they make the shot, they get $10,000. And the church doesn't have to pay it, which is really fantastic. <laughs> So we'd been selling raffle tickets for a long, long time, and, uh, and finally our big day was yesterday. It was this awesome turnout. People are excited. People came because people like to get free stuff. And so we just had a, we had a blast. We had hot dogs and tri-tip and all kinds of great, um, great things with our, with our people yesterday, and we auctioned off free stuff. And finally it came time to auction off the shot, the $10,000 shot. And so we, we draw the name of this guy. He's this, this really fit, active young guy. And everybody's kind of murmuring, oh, man, I think he's going to make it. I think he's going to make it. And now I, I will say th the guy whose name had been drawn and uh, several other guys in the church came up to me uh, before the, the name was drawn saying things like, hey, pastor, I just want you to, I want you to know, if my name gets drawn and I make that shot, I'm giving half of it back to the church. <laughs> to which I, it, my inner monologue was saying, I think the chances of that happening are about as good as you making a half-court shot, <laughs> right? I mean, because we love to get free stuff, but once we have stuff, it's a lot harder to give it away. But we love to get free stuff. So Jesus comes and he shares this mission statement from the prophet Isaiah that in this divine moment of inspiration, the scroll was handed to him by this attendant. And he reads these amazing words saying that the spirit of the Lord is on me and I have been, I have been sent to proclaim good news to the poor and freedom for prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, release for the captives to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Doesn't that sound like good stuff to give away? I mean, I'd want to be at the front row of that concert. Like, give me that t-shirt. That sounds fantastic, right? So, so Jesus says this to the crowds, and it says that all were amazed. They were saying things like, oh, man, that's Joseph's son. Yes, he's one of ours. That means that if he's given away good stuff like freedom and sight and, and release, we're going to be the first ones to make good on those giveaways. And, and pe you know, people were pretty excited. Now, uh, to understand a little bit of the context, part of the reason that people were so excited was because these words from Jesus are actually taken from the Old Testament laws. Now, these Old Testament laws, um, these were laws that God had given to the people of God, the people of Israel, called Israel, God's children. And these laws were given to them in order to make them basically uh, look different, act different, live different than the rest of the world. And I like to look back at these laws and say that this is where we first see that something called holiness and something called mission go hand in hand. Because here's the deal. God gives them these laws and, and ways that they're supposed to live and act and behave that make them be kind of set apart and different than the rest of the world. But the reason that they're set apart and different from the rest of the world is so that the rest of the world will look at them and say, wow, if a group of people can live like that and be that gracious to one another and that merciful to one another and that loving to even strangers from the outside, maybe there is a God who is gracious and merciful and loving. So their holiness, this set-apartness, living by these laws, actually became a part of the very mission of God reaching out in love and compassion to the world. How awesome. Well, one of these laws that was really important that God spent a lot of time crafting and developing for the people of Israel is about something called, now, I'm not just going to say it for you because it's a really fun word. You have to help me with this. Are you ready to help me with this? Because I'm not just going to, oh, you guys need to wake up this morning. And this is going to help you do that. All right, this is such a fun word. I think that to say this word, you have to have jazz hands. Everybody, help me out with some jazz hands here. And here's the word. The word is jubilee all right so say it with me jubilee awesome you guys are good that was fun let's try that again just because it's so much fun jubilee awesome oh you're so good you are awake now here's the deal with jubilee 
Jubilee, doesn't that sound like a celebration or at least a dessert with cherries and ice cream? I mean, it sounds like something really good, and it was something really good. You see, it was this year, or the year of the Lord's favor, as you heard Jesus read from the Isaiah scroll, this one year out of an entire generation that was set aside for the people of God to really, in a big way, look like this holy, missional people. And here was the deal that was supposed to happen in the year of Jubilee. Only once in a generation was this year supposed to come around. Anybody who was in debt, anybody who was locked up in the debtor's prison, anybody who owed anything was to be set free and released from their debt. Anybody wish that Chase Bank would have a year of Jubilee? Would that be pretty cool? I've been writing to Wells Fargo for quite a while and saying, I would be a better Christian if you would release me for my student loans, but they have yet to respond. Um, but the year of Jubilee was this time that everybody was supposed to be set free from their debts. And it was supposed to be something that, that not only was pretty cool if you were one of the debtors locked up in debtor's prison, it was supposed to be something that was supposed to sh change and transform and shape the very character of this people. Because imagine if you were one of these people who had been locked away in debtor's prison and the year of the Lord comes around and you are released and set free. Wouldn't that change who you are? Wouldn't that change the person you see when you look in the mirror every morning? Wouldn't that change your very reason for existing? It, it was this law that was meant to transform and reshape absolutely everything about the character of these people. Jubilee. It was more than a dessert with cherries on top, I'll tell you that. It, it, was, it was a big deal that was meant to be transformative to the people of Israel. And it sounds really good, because if you're one of those uh, folks in debtor's prison, or, or, or even somebody who your land has been taken away from you, um, you get your land back. I mean, it's a really, really good year. Awfully hard to enact, though, um, because once we have stuff, we tend to want to keep it. So when people are hearing Jesus come and use this jubilee language about people being released and captives being free and the year of the Lord's favor, people are saying, yes, we're going to get in on some of the good stuff. You know, jubilee, I think, is one of those practices that really does recognize um, that, that we are a part of these larger systems and structures, right? Uh, that when people are oppressed and imprisoned, um, that it's not just one person, it, that there's really a bigger, larger system. And I think that the, the Church of the Nazarene, at its very core, at its foundation, is a church very much shaped by this idea that holiness and mission go hand in hand. Some of us Nazarenes have been around for a long time. You've, you've heard the word holiness before. I, I would hope so. Maybe even those who have only been around a short time, I hope you've heard that word before. Did you know that holiness and mission go hand in hand? That the two really honestly cannot be separated? See, when the Church of the Wor uh, Nazarene was first founded, one of the guys who founded it, his name was Phineas Berzee. I've got a quote from him up here that I'd love to read for you guys. This is Phineas Brzee helping people understand why he's doing this new thing and leaving this established church to do something new and radical. Here's what he says. The field of labor to which we feel called is in the neglected quarters of the cities and wherever else may be found waste places and souls seeking pardon and cleansing from sin. This work we aim to do through the agency of city missions, evangelistic services, house-to-house -house visitation, caring for the poor, comforting the dying. To this end, we strive personally to walk with God and to invite others to do so. Do you catch that last line? To walk with God, holiness, to invite others to do so, mission. This is the very founding of the Church of the Nazarene. Oh, we don't have it? Bummer. That's okay. Um, but you heard me say it, so you absorbed it totally, right? Um, so this is the very founding of the Church of the Nazarene, this idea of holiness and mission that go hand in hand, the idea of holiness and mission. Now, the, the Church of the Nazarene, I also want to give you guys a little bit of background on the mission of the Church of the Nazarene and the global mission of the Church of the Nazarene. So if you've got a second to, to read that over, the next slide, um, mission really does go back, way back into the roots of the Church of the Nazarene. So the Church of the Nazarene got founded in the year 1908, long time ago. Phineas Brzee wrote that quote back in, I believe, uh, sorry, 1895. Long, long. That's why the language sounds funny, right? Church of the Nazarene got started in 1908. And um, uh, here in the United States in a place called Pilot Point, Texas, when the Church of the Nazarene got started, we already had a presence in Japan, 
Cuba, Cape Verde, and Guatemala. And that's because the kinds of churches that were attracted to become a part of this Nazarene movement, this holiness thing that was breaking out there in Pilot Point, those were churches that had at their very heart, at their very core, this idea of global mission. It was just infectious. It was a part of who they were. So at the very beginning of the Church of the Nazarene, we already had a presence literally spanning the globe and in many other places soon to follow. In 1915 is when we first began our global missionary society that today is called Nazarene Missions International. It's been called lots of different things. Most of them have the word women in there, but um, we, we've also let men come and be a part of the fun, which is good. Um, but in 1915 is when that all began. Now, when we first, as the Church of the Nazarene, decided that mission was something that we can't just leave to individual churches or individual people, mission was something that is so big it encompasses our entire church and who we are, they set up something that we today, that we today call the World Evangelism Fund. Now, I've got a slide here that shows us a little bit about what the World Evangelism Fund does. This is actually just a tiny, tiny, small sliver of all of the things that the World Evangelism Fund does. But one of the things that it does, it funds currently, today, there are 737 missionaries who are being sent from 40 world areas. When we think about missionaries, we usually think about folks here from the United States, maybe Canada, going to other parts in the world. But that's just not true with the Church of the Nazarene. All over the world, because we have this amazing missionary system, people are feeling the call of God to go, um, to go on this global mission, and they're responding in this incredible way. So from 40 different world areas, there's 737 missionaries that are currently being sent. 60 medical hospitals, uh, medical clinics and hospital. And, and literally the statistic on our compassionate ministry sites can't be counted. That's why we just say thousands of compassionate ministry centers, including our child development centers, because they're popping up so rapidly and quickly that we can't even keep count to give you an accurate number. I mean, that is exciting and amazing. This is the church that we're a part of. Isn't, isn't this cool? You, you can give me some Jubilee hands or something if you're excited about that. That's, that's great. Five seminaries, 33 Bible colleges, 13 liberal arts schools, and two nursing schools. And like I said, this is just a small snippet. Last night I got to talk with your, your missions president, Dan, uh, in the back here. And, uh, and he knows a ton about some of the things that's funded by World Evangelism Fund. Um, things like a broadcast ministry that has created programs, uh, like one that's being broadcast in Argentina and Brazil. It's called... Mujer Valiosa, and I am terrible with Spanish and a Spanish accent, but that's translated the valued woman. And this show has honestly become like Oprah in South America. I'm not kidding. It's become a big deal. It's won um, what would be the equivalent of their daytime Emmy awards uh, down in South America. But the amazing thing is, is where Oprah's kind of, you know, given away cars and t-shirts <laughs> and whatever, this show is teaching people about the hope of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? And women are tuning in all over South America. These are some of the things that's funded by this huge structure put in place called World, World Evangelism Fund. And we'll get to that one a little bit later. But uh, I just wanted to give you guys a picture that this is how the Church of the Nazarene first got started, with this impulse in them to have this incredible global structure and system where we can all be a part of the mission of God globally. Now, this is the mission of Jesus, this holiness and mission hand in hand with one another. But like I said, once we have stuff, it's really hard to give it away. Am I right? Once we have stuff, it's really hard to let go. So uh, thinking back to Jubilee and this incredible law that God had written out for God's people to enact and once in a generation to let everything go and, and to give back and to give it away, um, when we look back, actually, at the scholarship on the people of Israel, everything that we know from both biblical sources and non-biblical sources, do you know how many times the people of Israel enacted Jubilee? How many times do you think? Great big zero. Never once. This super important law, this year that was supposed to transform and reshape the very character of who the people of God are, and never once could they put in practice the actual acts of jubilee. They couldn't do it. 
Because once you've got this stuff, once the people who took the land and, and put debtors into prison, once they had the money and power associated with that, it became really, really hard to give it away. Well, here in the United States, the church, we've seen a little bit of that, haven't we? You know, back in the early 1900s when the Church of the Nazarene got started, there were actually lots of Christian mission movements uh, abroad. And, and things were just absolutely rocking for the church. Um, a, a, the Church of the Nazarene got started as this really poor, struggling denomination, just barely making it for years and years. If you think that now when you talk to your friends and they say, what church do you go to? And you say, oh, Nazarene. Has anybody ha said, oh, is that a cult? <laughs> like, I've never heard of that. Well, imagine a hundred years ago. It was a really weird and strange term. Nobody knew who the Church of the Nazarene was. This small, struggling denomination. And yet with every bit of who they were, they were constantly giving it away, putting it back into missions. In fact, the Church of the Nazarene, we were the forerunners for, um, for homes for unwed mothers and prostitutes. Isn't that incredible? I mean, that's at our DNA, the very beginning of who we are. But after a while, once you become established and, and you get lots of buildings and, and universities and institutions to keep up and look after, well, it becomes hard to give all that away, doesn't it? I had an incredible opportunity to meet with a group of pastors in Ethiopia. Um, working with Nazarene Missions International uh, back in 2008, we decided that we wanted to take our leaders, the, uh, the NMI district presidents, we wanted to take them um, to Ethiopia, which is a district called the Horn of Africa. And I, and I think we do have that up there. That's, um, that, that's the, uh, the western, I'm sorry, the eastern horn of the continent of Africa. You've got Ethiopia and Somalia and Sudan um, are a big part of that district called the Horn of Africa. Well, we decided to take our group of leaders out to the Horn of Africa because the Horn of Africa had a movement going on very similar to the early Church of the Nazarene, very similar to the early church, like disciples meeting in homes and, and breaking bread and the Holy Spirit descending on them. This amazing thing was breaking out in Ethiopia and all over the Horn of Africa, where they were literally planting a church every single day. Can you imagine that? Planting a church every single day. Pastors would, would be sent out to preaching points who didn't even have a Bible, and so they would have to go and borrow somebody else's Bible memorize, completely commit to memory the passage that they were going to preach and teach from, give the Bible back, go and recite from memory their passage and preach this passage at their preaching point. And things were just happening so rapidly and, and quickly that we decided, you know, we want to take our leaders and just give them a vision of what God is doing. Let them see a glimpse of how the Holy Spirit is being poured out in a way that might inspire us to come back to the United States, back to this place where we've got amazing buildings and institutions and programs and ministries. But we could use a little bit more of the Holy Spirit. So we, we took this huge group out to Ethiopia. There were over 70 of us um, that we led out to Ethiopia. And one of the days that I was there, I sat down with a pastor. Um, for, for short, we called him Emmy. And, and I got to talking with him. And, and as we were in conversation, one of the other pastors from the United States had thrown out something uh, like, hey, you know, I, I noticed you really, you guys really don't have many buildings. You have to borrow a lot of your buildings um, from other local government agencies or, or meet in hotels or homes or, or underneath trees. What if I were to organize a work and witness team? What if I were to organize a work and witness team and we could come out and we could build you a building? We'd pay for the materials. We would do all the work. You wouldn't have to do anything. How would that, wouldn't that be awesome if we came out and we built a building? And Emmy was this big, um, quiet man, but just so incredibly wise and godly. And he smiled, his great big smile, to let him know that he was grateful for the suggestion. But he very graciously declined the offer. And he went on to explain, and he said, you know, here in Ethiopia, the fastest way to kill a church that's growing is to build it a building. And all of us from the United States said, what are you talking about? You've got to have a building. You've got to have a building with awesome facilities for children and youth and, and air conditioning. I mean, you've got to have a building if people are going to want to come, don't you? And Emmy just kindly explained to us that, that at least there for the churches in Ethiopia, th there had been some groups that had come in and built them church buildings, but once they had a church building, 
suddenly this movement that had been all about giving it away, going out and giving it away, well, it turned inwardly focused on their building. And it became all about keeping up the building. And, and you spend all of your time and money and resources making sure that you take care of the building. And so Emmy, with his huge heart and his gracious smile, um, graciously declined that offer um, for us to come and to build a building there in Ethiopia. Once we have stuff, it's really hard to give it away. Jesus, when he first shared these words from the prophet Isaiah to the people there in Nazareth, they were amazed and they were excited to think about being the recipients of this stuff, of the sight and the freedom and the year of the Lord's favor. But then he went on to explain himself a little bit more. Did you catch that second part of the scripture reading? Jesus went on to explain himself a little bit more fully. And he said to them, Hey, you remember, you remember Elijah and Elisha? This is back from the book of First and Second Kings, if any of you guys are wondering where this reference comes from. He said, Remember Elijah and Elisha? Elijah and Elisha, these, these men of God who had the power of God to do amazing things. How many widows were there in Israel who were suffering from this incredible drought and famine when it didn't rain for three years? How many widows were there that really could have used the blessing, the power of God that Elijah had to bring? And yet Elijah was sent to, and I know that all those words in there, Zarephath and Sidon, you're probably like, what is he talking about? Let me boil that down for you. Elijah was sent to an outsider. Elijah was sent to give it away. The power of God in the hands of the prophet being given away for the sake of the world. And then Jesus goes on to say, oh, hey, yeah, and you remember his successor, Elisha, and how he also had the power of God? Well, how many lepers were there in Israel? How many sick people were there in Israel who really could have used a touch from God and yet not one of them was cleansed, but Elisha was sent to Naaman the Syrian, which again, let me translate for you, the outsider. The power of God being given away. Once Jesus explains himself a little bit more fully, how do the people of Nazareth respond? Well, they don't exactly have their jazz hands out anymore. <laughs> Am I right? In fact, they take Jesus to the side of a cliff. They're so furious with him at the, at the mention of the idea that they ought to be a people giving it away that they're ready to throw him off a cliff. We really like getting free stuff. We really love to be the recipients of God's gifts. But once we have them, it's much, much harder to give them away. Jubilee and the mission of Jesus uh, to set people free to pronounce good news to the poor and release to the captives. This is a call for each and every one of us to give it away. But not just to give it away in the sense of, because whenever I hear the word it, it makes me think, well, what is the it? Is it money? Is it power? Is it a building? It's not just giving it away. It's to be given away. When I was in Ethiopia, um, we had a, an interesting event occur at the end of our trip there. We had, we had spent our time in Ethiopia, and it, and it really was this incredible event that was meant to be something very different and to reshape us in a, in a significant way, where instead of a bunch of folks from the United States going over to, to do you know, good work for, for somebody else, we were going over to become learners, to sit at the feet of the leaders there in Ethiopia and to say, teach us. Tell us what God has been telling you. Uh, give us this vision. Give us um, th the dreams and the strategies that you are using here in Ethiopia that we might bring it back. And here's one of the things that we learned from that. We learned that we were not just about the mission of God when we were on this trip there in Ethiopia. It, in fact, we, we almost were, were on like a break, an educational break while we were in Ethiopia so that we could learn and bring it back and engage in the mission of God right there in our local churches and homes. And, and so I hope that you understand by that too that that means that the mission of God is not just something that you come here to hear 
the missionary from Bakersfield uh, come and talk about on a Sunday morning. It's something that the Spirit of God has empowered you for right here in Livermore. Well, while we were there towards the end of our trip, um, we had kind of scheduled, as, as many working witness trips do when you travel abroad, a little bit of time for sightseeing at the end of the trip. Because if you're going to, you know, pay that much money, everybody wants to go and see something kind of cool and interesting. So at the end of the trip, we hopped over uh, to Kenya, which you can see is not terribly far away. We went over to Kenya, to the southern part of Kenya, uh, where they had this really incredible safari that you can go and you can see zebras and lions and, and monkeys and all these really cool things. Uh, so we packed up in the vans and we head out for safari that morning. And it's basically supposed to be our letdown time after this really intense uh, 10 days that we had spent in Ethiopia, where every day is just honestly extremely exhausting. Uh, we were finally supposed to have some letdown time in Kenya. And so we're all enjoying ourselves. We got up really early in the morning because that's when most of the animals, especially the lions, are still kind of being active and things like that. So we got up really early in the morning so that we could see the very best stuff there was to see on safari. So we go out and we're all kind of patting ourselves on the back for our good stuff that we've done in Ethiopia. Way to go us, we've come to be learners. We're reversing this trend of the West is best and we are just you know, doing such good stuff. So we're patting ourselves on the back. We're out on safari, we're having a great time. Our vans stop. We'd gone out so early, we hadn't had breakfast beforehand, and so we stopped for breakfast at about 8 or 9 o'clock, and they'd set up this lovely breakfast for us, this outdoor breakfast in this really cool pavilion that's right there in the middle of the safari. Uh, I mean, there's monkeys in the trees. I mean, it was this incredible time. So we get out of the van, and we're walking in, and, and they've got these warm, wet towels for us to wash our hands with. I mean, we're people who've just been sleeping on dirt floors in Ethiopia for 10 days. This was a treat. So we're washing our hands with these warm towels. They didn't know we were Nazarene, so they were offering us champagne when we first walked in the door, which we all got pictures of and laughed and thought was awesome. Um, but it was just this, supposed to be this very nice time to kind of treat us at the end of this, of this trip as we we're patting ourselves on the back. We get in line to go through the breakfast buffet, and it's this hot breakfast that's been set out for us. And to keep a hot breakfast hot outdoors, um, they had these little canisters um, of some kind of a lighter fluid that is just constantly burning that is underneath each of these food serving trays. And, and there's basically a little flame in there. So, so we're in line, and I'm lined up, and we're all talking and laughing and joking and enjoying ourselves. And here's what I experienced, because I didn't know what had happened when I first experienced it. I heard a loud popping sound, and then I heard these women who I'd become friends with begin to scream and begin to run. And as I saw them running around, I saw that flames were engulfing their clothing and their hair. And then finally, people were able to basically tackle these women to the ground and beat the flames out of them. What had happened was one of the servers, one of the Kenyan women who was serving us, she had gone to refill the fluid before it had cooled, and it exploded. The fluid that was there to, to keep the, the food hot had exploded, and so some of that fluid had actually caught onto the women's hair and clothing. I mean, imagine how hard it is to put the flames out when there's actually, like, lighter fluid in your clothing. And so some of these women were burned very, very badly, and we actually had to call in um, a medical helicopter to come and to airlift these women to a hospital in Nairobi. And I found myself as one of the leaders of the trip suddenly uh, here we're supposed to be enjoying our relaxing couple of days in Kenya and instead I'm on one of these little tiny three-person uh, three, three person airplanes going back to this hospital in Nairobi so that I could care for these women that had been burned. You see, one of the women had no relatives there on the trip with her and she was burned so badly that she was going in and out of consciousness from the pain. And she needed somebody to be with there uh, with her to advocate for her in this Nairobi hospital. Because uh, we don't know what the hospital is going to be like in Nairobi. We want to make sure that she gets good care. We were very concerned. And so I was sent to go with her to basically be her advocate, to make sure that she got excellent, excellent care. So we get to the hospital in, in Nairobi, and it really was an incredible facility. Um, state of the art, you would have found a hospital like it here, um, here, in, Cal here in California. We get to the hospital, and I, I'm doing everything I can to make sure that she gets absolutely everything that she needs. If, if she's hot and she needs water, or she needs ice chips or whatever to make sure that she's got it, um, to make sure that we're filling out all the proper forms and the, all the legal stuff is done by the letter of the law. 
making sure that everything is done to protect her and make sure that she is well cared for. There's another woman who's there with us uh, who was burned as well, and her husband was there, and so he's doing everything that he can to make sure that she gets the care that she deserves. Well, somewhere in the hustle and bustle, I walk past this small room in the emergency room where they're still kind of triaging the women that have been burned, and I realize that the young Kenyan woman is in one of these triage rooms as well, and she's receiving absolutely no attention or care. And we start to talk with her and we find out that all this time that we have been doing everything that we can to make sure that our women are being cared for and that they have absolutely everything that they need, Phoebe, the name of this young Kenyan woman, hadn't even gotten a glass of water. We'd been there for hours and she'd asked multiple times and no one had brought her a glass of water because the whole staff was abuzz making sure that the Americans we're being cared for. And so suddenly, myself and, and the husband of this other woman who was burned, who was also a pastor, our entire mindset changed about the reason why we were there. And every time we'd have a nurse or a doctor come and check in on us, the question was, I'm sorry, have you already been to see Phoebe? Have you seen her burns? Do you know what degree they are? Has she gotten some water? Is there any way we can make her more comfortable? Has she gotten her painkillers yet? The entire tone of the conversation had changed. And even still, it became hard when you realize, well, when you realize that it's not as easy or as simple to give it away as we sometimes thought that it was. It, it's not as easy and simple to give it away when, when some of the power and the prestige that you have comes simply by by honestly, the color of your skin. And it's not fair. And how do you give that away? That hospital visit completely reshaped and restructured our entire time there and the way that we, that we saw um, the reason that we had been sent um, to, to Ethiopia and to Kenya. This call to give it away, not just to give it away, but to literally be given away. Because sometimes whatever the it is, we can't give it away. But we can, as followers of Jesus Christ, be given away for the sake of God's mission. This morning, the reason why you guys are having a faith promise day, the reason why your NMI folks set this up months and months and months ago, is because you are being invited, given an opportunity to be given away in a significant way. I know that the Discovery Church of the Nazarene, I know that you guys um, are constantly doing all kinds of things uh, to be given away here in your local community. But you are a part of a global church. You're a part of the kind of global church that when I, your preacher this morning, was stranded at this hospital in Nairobi, the Nairobi Church of the Nazarene came and picked me up on Sunday morning to make sure that I could worship with them. And folks, I was still honestly in shock from what had just happened and everything I'd seen and experienced last couple days. And that worship service ministered to me in a deeper way than I could begin to express to you this morning. This global church that we get to be a part of, it's the kind of church that, again, when I was by, by the, the bedside of a woman named Wilma for day after day after day, missing my classes back at the seminary in Kansas City, missing my husband and my work, the Nazarenes there in Kenya came to me and said, Shauna, you can go home now. You can book that flight. Wilma is ours now. We are caring for her. She's our sister. She's in good hands. You can go. We don't need you anymore, Shauna. We've got this. Because the Church of the Nazarene, at the deepest level, is, is a church that was made to be given away. And so this morning, as you've got those faith promise cards, this really is an opportunity for you to be a part of being given away as a church, to be a part of this global structure that has been put in place so that we don't become so closed off and so concerned about our own church buildings and the utility costs and, and keeping the lights on that we forget that we are a part of something so much bigger. And, 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 and so God help us if we ever became like those Nazarenes from Nazareth that Jesus first talked to who took him to the cliff 
and he slipped away in their presence, and they didn't even notice. He just slipped away from the midst of this angry crowd, and they didn't even notice that the Messiah, the Son of God, had slipped right out of their hands and left them all alone with nothing but their anger at the brow of a cliff. God help us. Now, I know that you folks here at Discovery, you are at an exciting place. Ever since we heard that Curtis and Jane were coming here last week, they're dear friends of ours, we've been praying for you guys. We're so excited about the things that are happening here. These are good days to be a part of the Discovery Church of the Nazarene. I truly believe that. And being a part of this faith promise this morning is essentially just ensuring that you continue to be a church that at your very core, at your very character, is being given away. You have an incredible opportunity this morning. Curtis will explain a little bit more about exactly what those cards um, are all about. But this morning, I would like the opportunity to just pray for you that the Spirit of God would be on you to be about the mission of Jesus. Would you pray with me this morning? Father God, we are so grateful that you have come and you are here in our midst. You have not withheld your spirit from us, but you are generous and gracious to pour your spirit out. Lord, would we be the kind of people whose character is so radically shaped and transformed by your practices, your laws, your decrees, your holiness, that the world would know that there is a God who is loving and compassionate and just and merciful. Father God, we want to be the kind of people for whom holiness and mission are so intricately connected that we can't even begin to imagine separating the two. Lord, would you empower this people this morning here in Livermore, California, to be about your mission, to be given away for the sake of those who are lost here in this community, for those who, for those who would fall in the category of poor, blind, captive, prisoners. Lord, your mission has power to transform even this morning. And for a global church, Lord, that is currently experiencing the growing pains of the outpouring of the Spirit, God, would you be so present with us that we would constantly and continuously be a church called to be given away. May each and every one of us take part in that giving away today and every day as we live in the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit and for the sake of the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray all these things. Amen. Now as you go, may the power of the Holy Spirit in your life allow your life to proclaim jubilee, grace, and peace.